you can let them in come with 601. I was still going live, I'm letting them in. Okay. As dawn breaks over Johannesburg, the busiest city centre in Africa harms to life as hundreds and thousands of South Africans stream into the city to chase their piece of the golden dream. Thanks to a vibrant revitalisation effort over the past couple of years, the Johannesburg CBD is the vital centre of life for the many who study, work and play there. And now, Clinix's first day hospital is right in the heart of the CBD to help sustain and enhance that life. So Clinix has got the longest history in the country of providing the platform for black professionals in particular to be able to deliver care in the private sector. And our, one, our oldest hospital in the group, Dr. SK Matseke, has been doing this since 1985. And we have got a great experience and we have got a large uh, network of specialists across uh, our facilities who are highly skilled uh, in the different uh, disciplines of, uh, of medicine. We are really uh, in a very good position to be able to make those uh, skills and expertise available to the communities and uh, the people who work and live in and around the job CBD. For more than 30 years, the clinics group has been striving to identify opportunities and meaningful ways to pay tribute to our founding fathers who epitomized the concept of black excellence from the start. And it is in tribute to these visionaries that this hospital is named after the astute businessman and legal expert, Dr. G.M. Bigger. Dr. Pitcher was, uh, to me, he, he was very, very special. Uh, from the home front, uh, he was my father's best friend. And uh, there would never be any important uh, occasion happening at home without uh, so he's always been there. Uh, at, at some stage in my life, I went through difficult times. He was there for me. You know, when I went through my difficult times, he was there to listen for me. When he went through his difficult times, when he had cancer, I was there to look after him. So I, I've got that special relationship with him. He, he, he's, a, he's a community leader to me, he's my father to me. He's, he's everything. The founding fathers, like him, is Dr. BJ, but actually he was a lawyer. Okay. Dr. Tato Matlala was a doctor but a businessman. Dr. Mukhesi was a doctor, visionary, a businessman as well. In, what, in whatever they did, they were quite diverse. Possibly if you look into his contribution in law, you'll find that it's major. Uh, he was the first president of, of uh, Black Lawyers Association. If you went into education, you will find that it also features in education. So they, they, were, they were a special breed of people that worked across their disciplines. The Dr. G. M. Bigge Day Hospital at 56 Von Villach Street in the heart of Joburg offers healthcare services in dentistry, dermatology, optometry, ophthalmology, physiotherapy, audiology, ear, nose and throat surgery, orthopedics, gynecology, pediatrics, maxillofacial surgery, as well as general elective surgery. The 36 beds in the state-of-the-art wards and private rooms provide a safe and comfortable space for patients to recover from same-day surgeries under expert supervision. The facility also offers doctor suites for consultations with GPs and specialists for all who work and live in the city. For the convenience of all its patients, the Dr. G. M. Bikia Day Hospital offers safe and secure parking and the use of a courtesy shuttle service for patients who need to be transported between other clinics facilities. You know, the business of clinics has always been to take care of the 
previously historically underprivileged uh, people and uh, we know that uh, our city centers are full of such people. Our city centers are now full of people from outside our borders, uh, from uh, the, 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 the Africa, the north of, uh, of where we are. And um, those people have not have had that, uh, they, they haven't had that, uh, the privilege of having the facility like the clinics, the hospital uh, that is coming up now. So this is going to be a fantastic uh, service for, for all of them. And uh, we hope that um, the people will uh, see the advantage of, uh, uh, you know, being service close to them where they are. I think that's the whole idea of clinics, to serve people closest to where they live. It is this ethos of excellence that provides a haven of health care for the denizens of Africa's busiest city. The Dr. D. M. B. K. Day Hospital at 56 Von Biller Street in the heart of Josie is open to all every day of the week from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. and welcomes all medical aids. And it serves as a fitting memorial to a remarkable man who dedicated his life to excellence. I'm a gynecologist, obstetrician, I'm founder of this hospital. I've been there since it was started. I work hard, I just deliver babies, I'm a delivery boy. <laughs> I came back from England being a specialist. I had no access to especially uh, hospital, private hospital services. So we had to build our own hospital. You know, those days are apartheid days. Patients were allowed in the private hospital, but I was not allowed to go and see the patients there. So I was disadvantaged in that way. And the old visionary doctors like Dr. Mutlana, Dr. Mukhesi, thought of an idea of having a black hospital. That's about 30 years ago. And this hospital, they went looking for money and they built the hospital. It has been flourishing since then. There are people who, who, uh, who didn't believe that the hus a private hospital could start. But there was one particular doctor, I must mention him, Dr. Matrana. He had that vision that one day things will change. It has been expanded by uh, clinics and uh, Dr. Matsike to what it is today. It's one of the best hospitals in, the, in Johannesburg. Now there's an avalanche of black doctors of all disciplines. It's, I'm vindicated, I feel vindicated, I'm excited about that. There's more staff. There's more nurses, and uh, it's a healthy environment. High-class theaters, second to none in, in this country. You need to have spe special facilities for black people here. So uh, this place grew. They saw the potential of this place. It can still, it has a capacity, I mean, of serving a community of four million people. It hasn't reached its capacity yet. Good evening, colleagues, and welcome once more to our weekly webinar. Webinar, webinar hosted by Clinics Health Group. Uh, we're excited once more to be meeting with you and bringing exciting topics, exciting speakers from different fields. And um, this evening, is, it's, 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 there's no exception to it. We're doing exactly that. Just uh, to indicate, we because of load shading, uh, the speaker who's going to be speaking to us has some trouble uh, to move from home to the university. So it's just uh, it's time to settle down. As soon as he settle down, he'll be able to log in and we'll start the, the webinar. Uh, just a reminder that um, when you receive the invitation, make sure that when you register for the webinar, you, sub, you give us your full details, your name, surname, and your profession and also indicate your registration number, whether it's from the HPCSA or from the nursing council, the pharmacy council, the allied health professions. 
and so that at least when we have that information, we can upload it uh, the following day, especially for those who are with the HPCSA, uh, because uh, with the HPCSA, you don't have to do anything. Once we have your details, we send them, we send the registrations, and you get your certificate uploaded and registered with the HPCSA. So do, do please check if you are getting your points uh, registered and uploaded on the HPCSA website. And secondly, uh, we also encourage colleagues when you log in just to mute yourself and uh, make sure that you also switch off your, your videos. Uh, with load shading, there's a lot of interruption and sometimes we've got a poor internet connection. It does affect uh, the quality of sound of the pictures as we continue with our presentations. Uh, one thing also to note that these webinars are CP accredited, as I've just mentioned, when you submit your details. And uh, also that we are streaming live on YouTube. I know that some colleagues would love to get the presentations, uh, speakers uh, come and uh, do the uh, talks when they come here. Uh, but it is possible to get the, the presentation on YouTube. But unfortunately, you can't download them and have them like a slideshow, but you can watch them from time to time at your own leisure. So do please uh, log into YouTube and like us on YouTube so you get uh, reminders about the presentations as and when we, we upload them on YouTube. And uh, the topic this evening is uh, an exciting topic. It's about a heart failure, but we'll give you the full details. We had indicated initials, uh, but last week we couldn't do that because of change of uh, Speakers, but uh, we hope that diabetes, when we talk about diabetic food from one of the general surgeons will be joining us. And just also note that we will be having our last webinar on the 1st of December. And on that day, we are hoping to have what we call a symposium. We'll be having two speakers joining us uh, for that webinar. And we're excited that we are uh, joining hands with one of the pharmaceutical companies to be part of uh, that, that session. But also for this evening, we also uh, uh, have been joined by one of the uh, pharmaceutical companies. We encourage colleagues to, from different disciplines to join us. And also it's exciting to see even some of the colleagues in the industry uh, wanting to be partner with us. So we hope that we'll have exciting uh, programs uh, next week, I mean, next month. So in that regard, we also want to request that if you have any uh, speakers that you want to recommend to join us for those webinars, please uh, don't hesitate to recommend speakers and topics to webinars at uh, clinics.co.za and indicate the topic that you want to have and give us the name of the speaker and the topic that you also want us to uh, present for next year. So we'll be sending out, when you at the end of this presentation every time or the following day, there's a survey also. So we just want to ask you to also complete that survey because that survey gives us an indication as to what is it that you liked during this year during the presentations and what are the areas uh, that we can uh, uh, look at and change so that we, 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 we meet your needs and we're able to continue to bring you exciting topics uh, from time to time. Uh, just a minute, the professor is calling me. I want to just take a call and hear what, yeah, thanks. So about that colleagues, uh, Professor Sabeta is uh, struggling to connect, but we hope that she will be able to connect in a few minutes. 
uh, and just indicate that we were excited that we're able to get speakers from different fields and from the different universities and other sectors who are uh, quite uh, prepared to share their thoughts with us. And this evening we've got uh, Professor Ngoba Tabete, who's a cardiologist, uh, who's the academic head of the Division of Cardiology um, at the University of the Bed Water Sound of Bates, commonly known. He's also the clinical head of the Division of Cardiology at the Char Charlotte McLeague Johannesburg Academic Hospital. He's an executive member of the South African Heart Association and chairman of the South African Heart Failure. Michelle, so we can have share registry. He's the vice president of the Heart Failure Society of South Africa and recently joined the executive committee of the South African Hypertension Society. He's passionate about teaching and training both undergraduate and postgraduate students. So you can see that he's an accomplished, accomplished academic and a clinician. He's got an MCHP from VETS in the fellowship. College of Physicians, uh, from, uh, CMSA, also a Certificate of Cardiology from uh, CMSA and also an in MED, Internal Medicine from Best University. And for this evening, we, we were asked him to speak about the passion uh, that he has, which is about uh, uh, heart failure. And so he wants to speak to us about the important role you can play in the management of heart failure patients and also do some case study presentation. So it means that it will be quite an engaging session where he speaks to us as uh, clinicians and also give us tools to empower us to be able to manage our own patients. In our midst, we have also uh, Mary Ann Falbino from uh, Novartis, who's uh, helping us uh, put together this presentation. So I'm going to give uh, just a few minutes uh, before we uh, let uh, Professor Tsabete, uh, whilst he's still sh uh, sharing his screen, I'll ask uh, Mary, uh, please just one minute, just uh, a few words you want to share with us. Mary Ann? I saw that she was connected. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, I am. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, am I there? No, I think yes, Prof is on already. Yes. Let's let him go. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Biller. You did very well in the trying to cover up. So thank you. <laughs> muted? Oh, you muted? Or you muted yourself? You okay, Prof? Uh, welcome. You want to say something, Mary? Miriam? No, I was just saying the prof is ready to go. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll say thank you at the end. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, prof, thank you very much. We no shading, technical <laughs> glitches that we had, but here you are, we are with you. I've just done the introduction. So if you manage to catch your breath and grab a glass of water and you're able to settle down in your chair, we are all yours, all yes, and we would glad to have you. Uh, coming back once more to this webinars, uh, we know that we've had you some time in the past when we started this webinars and welcome once again. Thanks for accepting the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bila. And uh, thank you again for everyone for uh, your patience with me. Uh, as he, Dr. Bila highlighted, just a few technical glitches and load shedding, but here I am. Uh, today, I'll be speaking to you about a very passionate topic of mine, um, the important role you play in the management of the heart failure patient. And then I'll close off with a case study uh, just to illustrate the practical implications of what we ought to be doing and what uh, we ought to know about patients uh, with heart failure. As per usual, I start with a disclosure slide. As you can see, I do a lot of uh, industry partner work, but by no means is this a promotional lecture. Uh, and this is a, an academic lecture of my own intellectual property that I'm presenting to you. So to start off, just to set the scene, I'm gonna start off with the definition of heart failure to put things into context. And I know we're living in a time where we are now overwhelmed with uh, apps and uh, artificial intelligence and technology, 
But rest assured that as a physician, your job is secured when it comes to heart failure, because this is a condition that requires you to apply your stethoscope and your clinical acumen to make a diagnosis and to put things together in order to coin this condition called heart failure. It's a complex clinical syndrome. Patients typically present with signs and symptoms that you need to identify the signs you pick up and the symptoms the patient tells you and you tease out from the history and really caused by structural and functional abnormalities of the heart, uh, functional such as the heart being unable to contract optimally as well as being unable to relax optimally. We'll touch uh, base on that the issue of diastolic dysfunction and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the last frontier. Structurally, you could have other elements such as valvular dysfunction, where you have a leaking or a stenosed valve and patient may present with uh, symptoms of heart failure that ought to be managed. But ultimately what happens is these conditions together reduce cardiac output and lead to an inability to meet the metabolic demands of the body, hence patients become symptomatic. And furthermore, the heart performs these critical functions at a state of an elevated intracardiac pressures um, at rest when they're quite advanced. Sometimes at rest, the patients may seem asymptomatic and you need to stress them. And when they tell you that they have symptoms on exertion, then you know that during stress, um, these elements are occurring during um, a, a, a strenuous activity of the heart. Before we use a cartoon of the typical prototype that we see uh, where a normal heart uh, the cartoon or diagram illustration on your left-hand side, which then remodels into a thinned out dilated left ventricle that essentially has fail, failing to contract optimally to pump a sufficient volume of blood to meet the metabolic demands of the heart. This is the classic prototype. When we say heart failure, this is what comes to mind. And we know that there are many etiologies of heart failure or many conditions, medical conditions that ultimately uh, first of all, cause myocardial harm, and then those that precipitate myocardial injury. We have primary cardiac problems such as rhythm abnormalities, valve defects, primary muscle uh, abnormalities such as non-compaction cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, to name a few, ischemic heart disease, coronary artery disease, where there's blockage of the coronary arteries leading to infarction of the myocardium and failure to contract. Any condition that is sustained, such as hypertension, a disease of the pericardium, myocardium, or endocardium will ultimately lead to this final common pathway, which we call heart failure. In South Africa, the most common cause being hypertension, especially when left untreated for many years. We also have pulmonary causes leading to what we call as core pulmonale, a primary lung injury that leads to right heart dysfunction and eventually failure. And then the other medical conditions, which their primary role is really to precipitate. So the heart is already structurally abnormal, functionally abnormal, but the patient is somewhat compensating. And with a secondary hit from many of these other comorbidities, degenerates the patient into symptomatic heart failure. We also know that this uh, condition uh, closely associated with poor lifestyle choices, excessive alcohol misuse, uh, uh, poor uh, uh, diet um, uh, control with excessive salt intake or fluid intake in a really compromised heart, all of these leading to heart failure. And not to forget, last but not least, rheumatic fever, which leads to rheumatic heart disease, another entity that we see quite commonly in sub-Saharan Africa and South Africa. So these are all the conditions that one needs to tease out on history and examination and in initial investigation to coin the diagnosis of heart failure. I like showing this uh, pyramid because it puts things in context with respect to a bird's eye view. Often the patient that you see represents 10% of what the entire population of at-risk patients with heart failure. Looking at the American College of Cardiology staging or American Heart Association staging, which is A, B, C, D, we can see that class A, we have patients who are at risk of developing heart failure. By far, this is the majority of the population um, accounting for most patients, either a history of hypertension, diabetes, a family history of cardiomyopathy. This, these are high risk individuals of developing heart failure. And then when these patients eventually have structural and functional abnormalities, they then get promoted to stage B where they are asymptomatic. However, they already have injury to the myocardium. This is also a significant group. And together A and B account for more than 50% 
of the at-risk population of heart failure. Note that because of the body's incredible cap capacity to compensate, many patients remain asymptomatic. And by the time they present to hospital with shortness of breath, poor effort tolerance, fatigue and dyspnea, um, already it means they are at a critical stage. And this is where stage C, and these are the symptomatic heart failure patients. Note that at this stage, this is where New York Heart Association classification comes into play, where we talk about patients being symptomatic at rest, having class four New York Heart Association, and if they have uh, remain asymptomatic despite moderate levels of exertion, remain in class one. And then uh, ACC stage D, which is synonymous with New York Heart Association class four, these are the refractory end-stage heart failure patients with no prospect of survival unless we give them heart transplantation or some form of left ventricular assist device. But this is important to always put this at the back of your mind to appreciate that this patient I'm seeing, where is he likely coming from? What has been his natural history in order for him to be here and now in the ward with signs and symptoms of heart failure? Briefly, the etiology in, uh, in uh, Africa, unlike the West, where ischemic heart disease accounts for 66 or two thirds of heart failure, 66%. In uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, including South Africa, hypertension is by far the leading cause, followed by together uh, uh, primary cardiomyopathies, as well as ischemic heart disease, which is increasing uh, from what we see. Note that the ischemic heart disease that we see is also referral bias because many of the research studies that report this epidemiological data uh, occurring in cardiac units where patients who have heart attacks, uh, ischemic heart disease get referred for further workup. Bring it home, looking at the Heart of Soweto study, we can appreciate, again, uh, the commonest form being idiopathic cardiomyopathy, 30% where patients present with heart failure of unknown origin with no underlying um, hypertension. This is an area of much research that I'm interested in and involved in. We also have hypertension, and, and then further again, ischemic cardiomyopathy. And you can see that these three accounting for almost 60 to 70% of the causes of heart failure. And then the other uh, elements such as valvular cardiomyopathy, arrhythmias, accounting for smaller contributions of heart failure. I'm not going to uh, revise the New York Heart Association classification for you, but what I want to highlight are just these pertinent points that we know that there's a clear relationship between the severity of symptoms of patient as well as the survival. So if a patient is high, highly symptomatic, their survival is reduced. However, with respect to the correlation of symptoms and ventricular function, we know that there's a poor relationship. And what am I saying here? I'm saying that some patients may have advanced left ventricular uh, systolic dysfunction with EFs of 10%. However, they are in functional class one. And similarly, patients may be in functional class four yet the ventricular ejection fraction might be quite severe. And then last but not least, patients with mild symptoms may still have a relatively high absolute risk of hospitalization and mortality. And this is an important principle because heart failure patients are never stable. Although the patients may be functional and they are coping with the activities of daily living, they are always an at-risk population and demanding that we give them the best medical therapy that's available um, for them timelessly and efficaciously to reduce the burden of poor outcomes. These are the typical signs and symptoms I'd like you to, to always look for when you're seeing these patients. A typical elevated jugular venous pressure with a positive hepatojugular jugular reflux, an S3 gallop or third heart sound with a lateral displaced apical impulse that's poorly palpable, and sometimes with a functional cardiac murmur from a dilated mitral valve annulus. And these are the signs that you need to find at the bedside. No app, no artificial intelligence or technology will take this away. Uh, this condition needs you as a physician to have a high index of suspicion. This is our traditional classification. We talk about heart failure being uh, uh, re referring to patients with an ejection fraction of less than 40%, although practically we treat them very similarly with an ejection fraction less than 50%. Those with an ejection fraction above 50% with the typical signs and symptoms, we, we've, they are called uh, to have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And then we have the middle group, which is heart failure with mild and reduced ejection fraction. Previously, it was called middle range ejection fraction. We now know that these patients respond just as well to medical therapy that we know has improved outcomes in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And that's the typical understanding that many of us 
have had for many times, for many for, for a long time, that this is what heart failure is. But I will impress upon you today the unmet need and some of the new therapies that bring promise for patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Note the typical pathophysiological and morphological differences in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, a patient with an increased end diastolic volume, decreased wall thickness, and the low ratio of mass to volume. Whereas those with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, it's a diastolic problem, failure of the heart to relax optimally with increased wall thickness and mass and a high ratio of mass to volume. So one ought to consider these different entities and the various mechanisms. Remember, diastolic dysfunction is also an active process. The myocardium utilizes ATP in order to relax optimally. So this is also an active process that one needs to be aware of. I'm just illustrating these two uh, uh, diagrams where we can see the parasomal long axis view and echocardiogram. This is what we see typically uh, a very poorly functional heart. This is the left ventricle that I'm pointing. This is the mitral valve. Uh, this is the left atrial, which is enlarged. It's almost double the size of the aortic root. That's the aortic valve and the left ventricular outflow tract. A very typical image that we see uh, convincing us that this patient indeed has um, heart failure with uh, uh, poor ejection fraction. And then we can see uh, next to that is the apical four-chamber view, uh, left ventricle, left atria, right ventricle, right atria, mitral valve, tricuspid valve. Again, a global systolic dysfunction. Um, uh, and you can appreciate how this left ventricle hardly contracting, looking very tired or rather very lazy to function. And that's largely because of the pathology that has ensued. But in 2021, uh, we came together, the, the European Society of Cardiology at the ASC Congress uh, presented these uh, new heart failure guidelines, which were published last year. And just to show you how easy it is to make a diagnosis, clearly for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, the typical signs and symptoms that I talked about if present, once you've confirmed on any form of imaging, whether it's echocardiography, a MOGA scan, uh, um, cardiac MRI, one can coin the diagnosis of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Fortunately, in our setting, most of these patients present very symptomatic, very advanced. It, it's almost easy to diagnose. You do not need to do natriuretic peptides to, to confirm this diagnosis. The other far extreme heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the patients typically have the signs and symptoms. Hence, I said, as a physician, your job is secured with this condition. However, you need to, to demonstrate evidence of an increased ejection fraction, as well as evidence of diastolic dysfunction, which is usually confirmed by the presence of a diastolic uh, 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 increased left ventricular, uh, uh, diastolic pressures, raised left ventricular filling pressures, raised natriuretic peptides, as well as an enlarged left atria, also with raised left atrial filling pressures. And these are largely echocardiographic parameters. So as you can see, this entity clearly needs more. So if you are working in collaboration with a cardiologist or a cardiac sonographer, please prime them, especially when you are concerned that the patient might have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, that they need to report and describe the, the typical characteristics in keeping with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And then last but not least, the child in the middle, heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction, behaving very similar as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction with an ear for 41 to 49%. And uh, again, a pleasure to diagnose this condition because we know that a lot of the evidence-based therapies that we have work here just as well. And this was the condition, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, where we didn't have much knowledge in terms of how this condition would respond. So this is what I hope you, you do in your clinical practice. When you see a patient, you are suspicious of heart failure. Note that heart failure increases, the prevalence increases with age. So elderly patients who are complaining of poor effort tolerance, uh, short of breath, please don't just um, dismiss them and say it's old age. Please consider heart failure and follow this uh, typical algorithm. For heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, it's usually very easy because the patients are often obvious with edema, raised JVP, and you can make the diagnosis a mile away. What we want from you is to consider a suspected patient to look at the risk factors. Most of our patients have a background history of hypertension, 
They may have a history of ischemic heart disease and idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. They may have no history, but consider a family history because we are, we are of the opinion that this may be a familial condition. You then need to examine the patient, confirm the typical signs and symptoms that you expect them to have. And then also uh, of note, a, a, a 12 lead ECG at the bedside. If it is abnormal, it is a rule in. If it is normal, if a normal 12 lead ECG, you can confidently say this patient is very unlikely to have um, heart failure. If in doubt, especially for patients with mildly reduced or preserved ejection fraction, and you're uncertain if this is truly heart failure, this is where the natriuretic peptides come in. And note that they are not diagnostic by themselves, but they rule in. Their true value is their strong negative predictive value. So if a natriuretic peptide is negative, you can confidently conclude that this patient does not have heart failure. That is the strength of this test. But if it is positive, it rules in heart failure, including other differentials that you then need to still uh, exclude. Once all of these are positive and abnormal ECG together with positive natriuretic peptides, the next step to classify your patient is to do some form of imaging. And the imaging that is readily accessible with less exposure to radiation, very safe. The challenge with echocardiography is that it is operator dependent. So you must have confidence in whoever's performing this form of imaging. And with the echocardiogram performed, you may then confidently diagnose the patient to have heart failure and furthermore, classify them into reduced, mildly reduced, and preserved ejection fraction. Note, the normal natriuretic peptide, a normal echocardiographic finding, heart failure is highly unlikely. You have to consider other differentials. As you noted that the typical signs and symptoms are very nonspecific, one of the important differentials we'd like you to exclude is to ensure that patients do not have underlying pulmonary disease, which could be the driver of the symptomatology that we see. So now we've made the diagnosis. Our patient is admitted, and this is the typical course that one can expect from inpatient to outpatient. Typically, patients are uh, decompensated uh, early on in the admission. We need to use many a times intravenous therapies such as IV diuretics. We fluid restrict them. We put them in foulless position, semi foulless position, we support them, we give them oxygen if they are hypoxic. And at this stage, this is where we need to consider what has been the precipitant. Remember, I showed you in the initial pyramid that patients are usually asymptomatic and they are well compensated. Their body is able to keep them uh, functional with no complaints and usually it takes a secondary hit. Uh, the common ones are infections, a urinary tract infection, a lower respiratory tract infection, uh, to tip them over to make them symptomatic. It could also be a new onset arrhythmia, commonly atrial fibrillation, anemia. It could also be a non-compliance such as excessive fluid uh, um, ingestion in a patient who was on therapy. And these patients then uh, deteriorate even further. And from admission, we then switch as patients are improving, their functional class improves, their edema is less. They are now mobilizing to the toilet. They are talking. They're quite active in the ward. We transition to oral therapies. And that's the oral therapies. These are what we call the neurohormonal therapies that I'll be talking about, which are life-saving. And this is where you then need to start low, go slow, but importantly, get them to target because it's only when they have optimal targeted therapies that we can benefit and get good outcomes. Note that as you then optimize the patients and preparing them for discharge, we need to plan for an early post-discharge phase visit. This is essential because we know that if the patients have improved well, you discharge them and you don't have an early post-discharge follow-up, they are at risk of decompensating and getting readmitted again. And it's to prevent readmissions for hospitalization because hospitalization has been shown to be associated with poor outcomes in these patients. It's almost like a secondary insult to them. And then we want to transition to outpatient care where we then follow them up as we continue to up titrate to their life-saving medical therapy that they ought to be on. Let's look at the context now. We've made the diagnosis. The patient has been admitted. During admission, the patient's physical function is low. This is when they are at phase one. Note the top, we're talking about excellent physical function. At the bottom, we're talking death. And then on the 
x-axis, this is time. I haven't given units in time, but you can appreciate it's exponential. I'm just trying to show you what's the natural history of this condition over time as we follow up the patient. Phase one, the patient is optimized. He feels better. He was admitted from intravenous therapy to oral therapy. He's well, he's happy, he's discharged. Doctor, you're an excellent doctor. You know what you're doing. And he's now in the outpatient. So physical function has improved. This is the stage, what we call the plateau phase, where many of us think these patients are stable. We think we're doing well. They visit you on, in your outpatient rooms. They're excited that the medication is done beautifully. The shortness of breath, the pedal edema has improved. The problem is if you consider the natural history over time, this patient will have another hit, which manifests in the form, as I said, new onset arrhythmias, anemia, endocrinopathies, infections, and they will decompensate. And we get them back, back again, we treat that insult and we get them back to baseline. But with repeat uh, hospitalizations and decompensations, the patients deteriorate and eventually they reach phase four where they are now in advanced heart failure, refractory heart failure. This is ACC stage D. And at this stage, the prospect of survival is only possible with transplant of ventricular assist device. Note, during the course from the initial admission, while the patient is in the plateau phase and they're quite stable, while the patient is having advanced heart failure, there's a risk of having sudden death events. And these are usually caused by lethal arrhythmias. The most typical being ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. So hence, there is recommendation, which I will come through later, where some patients with poor ejection fractions, they could be candidates for an intracardiac defibrillator. And that's because it treats these episodes. That's why some patients, you see them, you're happy. A week later, the family members tell you, sorry, our father, our uncle, our brother, our sister, our mother has died unexpectedly to your surprise and disappointment because you thought the patient was doing well. Hence the notion, heart failure patients are never stable. That's why we have to be intentional about our therapy. We have to be intentional about giving them life-saving therapies in order to improve their chances of survival and giving them a life worth living. In this illustration, I just wanted to highlight that with each decompensation and the chronic decline, the mortality rate increases. So over time, expect your patients to have poorer and poorer outcomes. Sadly, despite all the therapies I'm about to talk about, our four to five year mortality rate still sits at a staggering 50%. Furthermore, our 30 day readmission rate is high, sitting at about 20%. And at one year, we're looking at 60%. By five years, we're looking at 80 to 90% rehospital rehospitalization. So this is a highly burdensome disease that affects patients' lives, it affects their quality of life. And as I said, 50% heart failure deaths occur suddenly. So it's not that every patient will decompensate and come to hospital. Sometimes the patient will think he's doing well and will just suddenly have a sudden cardiac death and die. Now, if I were to say to the audience that you have just been diagnosed with leukemia or your mother, has been told she has breast cancer or your father has a lymphoma, you would be very stressed. You would be in fact shocked and disappointment. But how many of us deliver a diagnosis of heart failure and we don't counsel and emphasize what this grave diagnosis means? If we consider the five-year mortality, I've already told you we're sitting at approximately 50% for heart failure despite all the best therapies that we have. Heart failure has a worse prognosis than many of these malignancies if diagnosed early and treated optimally. And you can see that uh, the malignancies, the diagnosis, just telling a patient sends a shiver up their spine. So let us be intentional, not to scare, not to frighten our patients, but to emphasize just how important this diagnosis is and the impact it will have on their lives and their family. So that this disease is taken seriously and even ourselves, we don't consider it as mild edema, but rather a grave diagnosis that needs us to have all hands on deck to save our patients and to improve their mortality. Briefly, what are the aims of therapy? We want to improve our patient's symptoms. We want to prevent rehospitalization. As I told you, it's very common. We must be intentional about it. 
We want to reduce the mortality. Everyone wants to live and no one wants to have their life shortened because of a diagnosis of heart failure where therapy is available and we can improve outcomes. Let me take you through the history. In 2016, many of you who may have attended some of our heart failure lectures, this is what we were uh, advocating, a very much stepwise approach that suggested we start off with the neurohormonal therapy of ACE inhibition and beta blocker. When patients are still symptomatic with the presence of reduced ejection fraction, we said add a mineral corticoid, receptor antagonist such as spironolactone or a plerinone. If the patients decompensate or they're still symptomatic with poor ejection fraction, we then said add the ARNI, a combination of the angiotensin receptor blocker of Valsartan with the neprilysin inhibitor, succubitol, to replace the ACE inhibitor. And this algorithm was very much comforting to physicians because we gave them a ladder. Start here, step one. Come here, step two. But what we learned was that this was robbing patients of early and efficacious life-saving therapy. We knew from the paradigm trial that ARNI was superior to ACE inhibitor. Yet, because of the trial design, it was recommended to be used only in patients if they decompensate. But our paradigm has changed. We have now learned that there are four principal therapies that we have to prescribe for all our heart failure patients. Those are the ACE inhibitors, preferably the ARNI, and patients who are angiotensin receptor blocker intolerant, uh, ACE inhibitor intolerant to use an ARB. But the ARNI, bear in mind, is not an exchange of a RAS modulator. It's actually the addition of neprilysin inhibition. Note that the A and the R is the angiotensin receptor blocker. The N and the I stands for neprilysin inhibition, which is succubital. This is together in concert or in synergy with beta blocker therapy, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist therapy, and the new kids on the block, empagliflozin and dapagliflozin, which have also, uh, in a very short space of time, hardly five years, have now transformed the heart failure landscape where these agents are saving lives in all spectrums of heart failure. Note the loop diuretic, important in the acute setting in a congested patient. However, these agents do not uh, confer chronic or long-term mortality benefit. In fact, in patients who may be uh, hemodynamically unstable or uh, hemodynamically labile, meaning as you uptritrate your beta blocker, your MRA, your ACE or ARNI, the blood pressure may not uh, uh, be suitable one of the strategies is to cut down on the diuretic and advise and empower your patient to manage his fluid intake. And this will give you room to uptritrate these agents to target because we're blocking the neurohormonal sequelae, which is what is causing harm and injury to the patient. So in 2022, this is our new dogma. Every patient with heart failure needs to be on an ACE inhibitor or the ARNI with the ARNI preference because of the neprilysin inhibition beta blocker, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, and the SGLT2 inhibitor. If your patient is not on these four therapies, you are doing a disservice. You're causing harm, and we do not want that. We want you to be compliant and to get with the program because we want to save our patients. We don't want them to die. Note that in addition to these four pillars, which is what I'm going to emphasize today, we have these other second line therapies such as CRTPD in patients with dyssynchrony, left bundle branch block, especially more than 150. In patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy, where we can use an intracardiac defibrillator and other nonsenses where these agents may be beneficial, such as evabridine in patients with a resting heart rate of more than 70 or hydralazine nitrate combination, especially in patients of African ancestry, where we can improve outcome. So there are other levels of care, but I want to impress on you, everyone, must be on these fantastic four drugs. Otherwise, you're doing a disservice for the patients. And you can see indications for these agents, ARNI, Evabridine, as well as the SGLT2 inhibitor, patients with reduced ejection fraction, patients with symptomatic heart failure, and these agents, importantly, are used in concert and synergy. These agents are not fighting with one another. It is, it is the budget and the medical aid that may make you want to think 
these agents, you must choose one over the other. All four work in synergy and all four must be prescribed if you want to give your patient the best chance of survival and a meaningful quality of life. I briefly want to touch on some of the indications of early dosing of the ARNI because in 2016, in the algorithm I showed you, we waited. The guidelines said, wait for patients to decompensate and then consider switching the ACE inhibitor for the ARNI. But we now have data that shows that the ARNI can be used early, similarly with the SGLT2s, which I'll come to shortly, in patients with reduced ejection fraction, in patients with a confirmed elevated natriuretic peptide, so essentially heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, as long as these patients have been hospitalized for more than 24 hours and, and may still be in hospital, they remain hemodynamically stable, meaning they have a systolic blood pressure of more than 100 for at least six hours. There is no indication for escalation of diuretic therapy or vasodilator dose for at least six hours, and there are no intravenous anotropes for 24 hours. If your heart failure patient who's admitted fulfills these criteria, you have the green light. You can start the ARNI in that admission uh, hospitalization so that we want to get our patients on these elements or these fantastic four drugs early on in their journey so that we can improve their outcomes. Now, while there's a lot of excitement with the SGLT2s, and you'll hear many discussions about them, there are benefits in diabetes, there are benefits in heart failure, there are benefits in kidney protection, there are benefits in uh, non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease. No, don't forget the traditional therapies which are affordable, which are available. Don't neglect them. The evidence is compelling. 30% reduction in uh, composite outcomes for heart failure, mortality, as well as hospitalization with beta blockers, with mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, as well as 16% reduction for both ACE inhibitors as well as the ARBs. These agents work. Let's use them. Don't suffer from physician inertia and fail to treat your patients optimally. Importantly, this is the neurohormonal sequelae that occurs as a result of a poor LV that doesn't contract well. As the LV systolic function deteriorates, the neurohormonal mechanisms become augmented. These include the renin angiotensin system. These include the sympathetic nervous system, as well as the natriuretic peptide system. The poorer the ejection fraction, the more symptomatic a patient, the high this neurohormonal system is augmented and hence the need to start low, to go slow, but to get every patient on the fantastic four drugs and to get them to target. These are the various mechanisms that we're inhibiting. The sympathetic nervous system, you can see causing vasoconstriction, increasing in RAS activity, increasing in heart rate, harmful to the patient. The renin angiotensin system, similarly mediated through angiotensin II, acting on the angiotensin type one receptor. Note the sympathetic nervous system, looking at both epinephrine and norepinephrine, acting on alpha one, beta one, and beta two receptors. Hence, in heart failure, we prefer uh, a, a broad spectrum, non-selective uh, beta blocker to modulate the sympathetic nervous system and hence the benefit for beta blockers. Modulation of the renin angiotensin system mediated by ACE inhibitors or ARBs and ACE intolerant patients as well as um, uh, and, uh, the ARNI. And then last but not least, the benefits of the natriuretic peptide. This is a natural and occurring endogenous system that counters the harmful effects of the sympathetic nervous system as well as, as well as RAS. And by harvesting the benefit of this system through the action of neprilysin inhibition by circuital, we then harvest the benefits. And as uh, in, in, uh, in or Vermada, the Vosartan blocks the renin angiotensin system and then beta blockers act on that mechanism. And every patient deserves a chance to benefit. Again, remember the initiation of the ARNI or Entresto is that in patients who are ACE in, uh, taking ACE inhibitor therapy uh, who are not de novo, um, one needs to wait for 36 hours for a washout and you can start with uh, the Entresto at 100 milligrams twice a day and every three to four weeks step up to the target dosing of 200 milligrams. Similarly, in a patient on low dose of ACE or ARB, we have to allow the washout period of 36 hours and then start at 50 milligrams twice daily 
and then we up titrate to 100 milligram twice daily. In a further three to four weeks, we want to eventually get everyone on 200 milligrams twice a day. And I've already highlighted that we can use it early upfront if the patients are hemodynamically stable, systolic BP more than 100, as well as uh, no indication for escalation of diuretic therapy or vasodilator therapy, as well as no intravenous inotropes for 24 hours. Now, coming to the SGLT2 inhibitors, which I cannot ignore, I have to discuss because these are the new kids on the block and everyone wants to learn and know about them. Um, these therapies traditionally uh, discovered from the apple tree, the bark of an apple tree, um, and, and eaten by a koala bay, which was uh, basically noticed to be urinating excessive amounts of glucose. And the idea of potential use of this for diabetic therapy and through the harmful effects of the glitazones causing increased cardiovascular effects the, that promoted the need for cardiovascular outcomes trials to confirm safety in these diabetic trials led to these uh, uh, cardiovascular outcomes trial. And while these outcomes trials were being conducted, um, the benefit of heart failure prevention was noted, which was quite impressive. And it seems to be a cross effect but the two agents in the forefront are really empagliflozin and dapagliflozin. And from there, these agents have now been tested in DAPA HF, EMPRA reduced, that is basically heart failure reduced ejection fraction, EMPRA preserved as well as DELIVER, which is uh, a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And fortunately, uh, these agents have proven successful to improve heart failure outcomes. How do they work? They cause naturesis. They also improve renal function. They reduce preload and afterload and reduce left ventricular wall stress. And they also reduce interstitial edema without intravascularly depleting patients, which is important because diuretics deplete intravascular volume and these agents don't, and hence the benefits that we've seen. And while we have noted a huge success, a lot of trials have shown benefit, mortality benefit and heart failure would reduce ejection fraction from ACE inhibition, beta blockers, MRAs, including the ARNI, uh, uh, hydralazine nitrate, verisiguate, and omicaptive as well, which I haven't discussed in, these Asia, in, in this lecture. And um, the SGLT2s also showed benefit in heart failure reduced ejection fraction. And for many of these agents, this benefit also translated to heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. But for many studies, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction was the missing child, which never had. Uh, evidence-based therapies for success. In fact, in 2021, we were still in this predicament where we have shown excellent benefits in terms of reduction in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, reduction of heart failure, hospitalization, and mortality, but really no benefit in terms of heart failure with preserved e ejection fraction. And you can see we've been at it since 2003, trying to show benefit up until recently in the Paragon trial for ARNI in heart failure preserved ejection fraction, where we did not see a significant mortality benefit in outcomes. And this led then to a concern that of this huge unmet need. Here again, highlighting that for many of these agents in heart failure reduced ejection fraction, clear benefit, heart failure with mild reduced ejection fraction, some benefit, and heart failure preserved ejection fraction, difficulty to show a clear benefit in these patients. And this was consistent for many of uh, uh, the other uh, studies. And again, just highlighting the typical uh, endpoints that we've looked at in patients with heart failure to juice ejection fraction and how impressive these agents have been with respect to uh, numbers needed to treat as well as the absolute risk reduction uh, compared to um, uh, the comparators. I wanted to highlight also, be careful, heart failure therapies do cause side effects. Know the electrolyte abnormalities these agents cause, MRAs, loop diuretics, starzides, acetazolamide. And fortunately, the new kid on the block, SGLT2, seems to be uh, without any of these electrolyte abnormalities associated with the other neurohormonal drugs. Furthermore, I highlighted that many of the neurohormonal drugs we have um, um, fortunately, once daily dosing that needs to be up titrated. And, uh, for, and then the new kids on the block is GLT2. It's a single daily dosing, which does not need um, up titration. As you can see, 
no titration required. It's a single dose. And many of the others are BD dosing dosages except for spironolactone, but still requiring up titration. So SGLT2 requires single doning, dosing once a day with no need for titration. And because of the immediate beneficial effect, which I will show you in the kaplan meier curves, many physicians are liking these agents and also because of their safety. Note, however, they have a lower limit, a GFR of 20, uh, uh, and below these agents, SGLT2s are not indicated for these patients. And here I'm showing you the Emperor Reduced data, which showed clearly an impressive relative risk reduction for primary endpoint, as well as other secondary endpoints where that were quite positive. And uh, these agents are being very safe. And even though indicated in non-diabetic patients, they will not cause hypoglycemia. So patients will not suffer from that. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the foundational therapies of heart failure. Every patient must be on these. The ARNI, which is a combination of angiotensin receptor blocker with neprilocin inhibition, uh, where, which is superior to the ACE. The MRA, the beta blocker, and the SGLT2 inhibitor in patients with or without diabetes. It's essential. It's critical. It's important. I cannot overemphasize it. All your heart failure patients must be on these agents uh, simultaneously. Then briefly, as I land this plane now, I want to highlight this unmet need in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Medicine has evolved quite impressively, especially in cardiovascular diseases. Atrial fibrillation, we have given you oral anticoagulants for stroke prevention. We've given you beta blockers, calcium channel blockers for rate control. And in fact, some of the class one um, antiarrhythmic agents uh, for rhythm control. In patients with ischemic heart disease, for secondary prevention, we've got impressive data for aspirin, statin, beta blocker, as well as ACE inhibitors in patients with asymptomatic left ventricular systolic dysfunction. For blood pressure control, an important risk factor, the number one risk factor for heart failure in South Africa, we have thiazide diuretics, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, and angiotensin receptor blockers. For heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, I've just told you about the Fantastic Four. However, for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in 2021, all we had was diuretics to improve congestion. And so no treatment had been shown convincingly to reduce mortality or morbidity in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction uh, and those with uh, mild reduced, which we have now known, respond similarly. This is an uh, uh, extract directly from the ESC 2021 guidelines. What you will appreciate here is that uh, class 1C level of evidence, expert opinion, meaning no randomized control trial, no prospective study, um, that we basically treat risk factors, we treat the comorbidities, and we, we give patients diuretics. That's what we recommended for patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. For mildly reduced ejection fraction, we knew that they respond to some of our agents for HFRF, and hence these typical Fantastic Four drugs were recommended. Level of evidence, C, expert opinion again, and it was a 2B recommendation. And only 1C, again, for diuretics in patients with congestion. And so for the first time, ladies and gentlemen, we now have randomized control trial data showing mortality benefit um, in the, through agents of SGLT2, empagliflozin, and recently dapagliflozin for patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Importantly, as I highlighted, I wanted to show you the kaplan mia survival curves. They separate immediately. From week one, SGLT2 inhibitors are showing impressive impact in terms of re reducing mortality as well as heart failure hospitalization. So these agents are becoming very much favored. But as I highlighted, do not throw the baby out of the bath with the water. Let's consider our old agents which work and have stood the test of time in helping patients and with good quality data supporting their use. So with respect to this segment, I want to conclude to say heart failure is a life-threatening disease. Adherence to guideline-mandated therapy, including after training to target dosages, is essential, and patients with mild symptoms are not stable. We need to start these life-saving therapies to improve patient outcomes. And then to switch briefly to a clinical case, I know I'm running out of time. Uh, some of you may have other appointments. 
I present to you Mrs. TD, 62-year-old female pensioner, typical like many of our patients, the usual suspects, the usual criminals, hypertension, dyslipidemia, central obesity present with this patient, currently on lifestyle and dietary management, also a chronic smoker, a, a, a sad habit with a 40-pack year history of a pack a day. Patient presents now worsening history of shortness of breath on exertion, finds great difficulty walking up two flights of stairs. We can see on examination, this patient is obese, has a body mass index of 32. Obesity is a pandemic in South Africa that we note uh, we need to address um, as well because it drives many of the communicable diseases. Patient is hypertensive, tachypneic, grade three pedal edema with a raised JVP and a congested tender hepatomegaly. We look at the ECG, we can see this patient has left ventricular hypertrophy strain pattern. There's evidence of a biphasic P wave and V1 left atrial enlargement in keeping with uh, left elevated left atrial filling pressures. And we also have these deep uh, S waves in V1, V2 in keeping with right ventricular hypertrophy that this patient has. So clearly features of um, an enlarged heart uh, and enlarged uh, poor filling pressures. The chest X-ray on examination in keeping with uh, hyla fullness, we can see the upper lobe blood diversion. We can see the fluid in the fissures, all in keeping with features of failure. So this patient is in trouble. He's really, really sick. The LV here again showing clearly a poor left ventricular systolic function. So we effectively have coined a diagnosis of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and we have confirmed the presence of these typical signs and symptoms. And now this is the pressure point part. This patient has been started with 40 milligrams of furosemide. He's been given slow K, 600 milligrams PRN. He's on enalapril, five milligrams BD. This is the ACE inhibitor. Cavidolol, 3.125 BD as a starting dose. And aldactone, 12.5 milligrams BD. And the question that I put to you is, how would you manage this patient further? What are the opportunities here? I've already told you. Every patient needs to be on the Fantastic Four. I've highlighted the need to up titrate. So clearly, we have room for much improvement here. Number one, these dosages are low. So every visit, this patient needs up titration to target. For the enalapril, you're looking at 10 to 20 milligrams BD. For Cavidolol, you're looking at 25 milligrams BD for individuals less than 85 kilograms. And those who are weighing 85 kilograms and above, we need to soldier on beyond 25 milligrams BD um, until we can achieve 50 milligrams BD or where the patient becomes symptomatic. Spironolactone, we're looking at 25 milligrams daily and a target of 50 milligrams daily. But wait, I highlighted, why must we give the patient an ACE inhibitor when we can switch to an ARNI? We don't need to wait for them to decompensate. So this is room there's room in this patient that we can even exchange this enalapril for an angiotensin receptor blocker necrolysis inhibition. Note, if the patient had, was on background enalapril, we have to wait 36 hours to allow the ACE inhibitor to wash out to avoid the, uh, the uh, concomitant hydrogenic cough that may be caused by use of these agents. Furthermore, in 2022, the therapy is not complete without the SGLT2. And the benefit of the SGLT2 is that I do not need to up titrate the dosage for this patient. I can start them on uh, empagliflozin or depagliflozin, 10 milligrams once a day. So you can see that this in 2022 was acceptable therapy in 2016, but in 2022, it's outdated. And do not be caught out sleeping because your patients will not be happy when they learn that you have failed to give them life saving therapy. Ladies and gentlemen, for the sake of time, on that note, I will stop presenting and I will hand over back to the chair and I will invite questions. And I'm looking forward to your comments, discussions at this point. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Prof. Zavis. It's quite a, an in-depth uh, conversation, discussion, presentation that I've given to us. I think one thing that comes to my mind you know, as a practicing clinician, it is not a good thing not to attend this webinars or to attend any CME event. Um, because how would one know 
uh, that there are certain things that we're doing in 2016 that we don't do anymore in 2022. If any practicing doctor does not attend uh, these presentations, and I think um, I see this value in having these discussions because we're learning all the time. And thank you very much. Uh, I've learned quite a lot also. And it's scary to say that um, the patients, like I think you've explained this issue, this um, event about sudden death, and that it is within us to prevent that from happening. Not that we can play God, but we know that ultimately that event will happen. So we now have tools to anticipate it and stop it or prevent it from happening. And thanks for that. It's a take home for me. We've got a few questions and quite a number of uh, congratulatory messages that it's one of the best presentations. Every week when I listen to these presentations, I'll say good presentation. And uh, little do I know that the following presentation, we, we wouldn't make a similar comment. Uh, that's why uh, someone, uh, so we just want to, yeah, uh, there's the first question about uh, with, uh, with blockers, when and what pulse lower, when should we be concerned with? With Peter yeah, yes, blockers, yeah. With beta blockers, okay. Yeah. So um, the, the, the key elements with beta blockers, we want to up trade trade to target. What we need to watch, as you've said, is the pulse rate as well as the blood pressure because beta blockers also affect the blood pressure. And note in heart failure, we as much as we like numbers, don't just treat the number. So don't look for a 120 over 80 and say, okay, I'm still okay. As long as the patient is perfusing, meaning there's a normal renal function, uh, peripherally the patient is warm to touch and there's an adequate capillary refill time. The heart rate, we, with our bottom limit, we want to avoid symptomatic bradycardia. So once you start looking at a rates uh, below 50, that's where we, we are in that terrain. Between 60 and 50, that is still considered bradycardia. But if the patient is not symptomatic, it's acceptable. And mm -hmm. soldier on, be intentional, because what are we blocking? We're blocking these neurohormonal systems, which are harmful for the patient. And the beta blocker specifically targets the sympathetic nervous system. So switch soldier on. If you're using cavidolol as your go-to drug for heart failure to juice ejection fraction, target of 25 milligrams BD, Patients less than 85 kilograms, more than 85 kilograms, a target of 50 BD. So those are the, the markers, blood pressure, as well as uh, the heart rate. So less than 50, uh, a, a point to say, especially symptomatic bradycardia, perhaps I must now stop escalating. And then when I have, again, a symptomatic hypotension, a patient who now has renal dysfunction from poor perfusion, et cetera. But if the kidneys are happy, urea and creatinine are good, even at systolics over 100, over 60, 100, over 70, I'm happy. I maintain because that's what's going to give the patient improved outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is from Dr. Van der Horst, uh, one of our regulars. SGLT2 or GLP1 receptor agonists, which one, please? We, which one should we use between the two? Excellent question. So to date, there are no heart failure mortality benefiting data on GLP-1s. These two agents have almost hit the scene simultaneously. They both improve cardiovascular outcomes in terms of myocardial infarction in diabetic patients. But the benefit in heart failure seems to be strongly in favor of the SGLT2. And the two agents, as I said, that are, hold this benefit are largely empagliflozin and dapagliflozin, which are the preferred agents. And in fact, we name them in the guidelines as the drugs of choice because that's where the data comes. GLP-1s, mm. when you're using them, you're using them for the diabetes. You are using them also for the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, so the ischemic heart disease. The GLP-1s seem to have a competitive advantage with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, especially for patients who are at risk of stroke. And so in that setting, that's where they are seemingly better. And in the setting of a high atherosclerotic disease burden, so the patient has had an angio triple vessel disease with preserved LV systolic dysfunction, LV systolic function, GLP-1s would be the go-to drug. But once you have LV systolic dysfunction of any form, whether it's heart failure with preserved, 
heart failure with mild reduced and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, SGLT2 are your drug. So in heart failure, SGLT2 in preference. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And Dr. Lambert wants to know, uh, any place for calcium channel blockers in uh, heart failure with uh, HRF? So yes, um, as you noted in the algorithm, there was no calcium channel blocker mentioned. So calcium channel blockers are not uh, heart failure drugs. They are not there to improve heart failure outcomes. They're not part of our foundational therapies. But in the hypertensive patient where you are struggling, in the patient who has tachyarrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, you are struggling to get rate control. The agents that are, uh, can be utilized for calcium channel blockers, such as uh, amlodipine, can be used for blood pressure. But this is on top of the heart failure remodeling therapy. But now I want to, 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 to put to you and say, if a patient has hypertension, in fact, I like those patients because they give me room to up titrate my beta blocker, to up titrate my ANI, to up titrate uh, uh, the MRA to target without the fear of uh, hypotension or symptomatic bradycardia. So I would first use it as an opportunity to ramp up the other agents to target before adding a calcium channel blocker and saying I'm using it for hypertension because these agents, they have pleiotropic effects, both remodeling in heart failure, which is what we're using them for, but they are also antihypertensives and they work in these patients. So really the calcium channel blocker, not as a heart failure therapy, but perhaps as an add-on patient for hypertension if I'm really struggling for BP control. Thank you. Okay, okay thanks Thanks for that. Excellent talk. Uh, this is the next speaker, uh, participant. Uh, if a patient presented with arrhythmias, would you suggest ablation even after the patient was treated with first with a, I don't know, this drug? Uh, Flecanide. Like, like, like tamboco or, or how else is this? How else would be the uh, ablation? Ablation. Beautiful question. This is something very topical. In fact, I'm currently supervising a PhD student where we're looking at this in our local setting, um, the burden of atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation is a, is a terrible, terrible uh, comorbidity in heart failure because it uh, causes, first of all, tachycardia, and we know that tachycardia can induce or exacerbate cardiomyopathy. It impairs the diastolic filling period. So patients are usually even more symptomatic when they have atrial fibrillation. So it's one of the conditions that we are now recognizing that for heart failure, a rhythm strategy or a rhythm control needs to be the anchor in atrial fibrillation. Most patients with atrial fibrillation, the dogma has been if you can't afford or can't manage to keep the patient in sinus rhythm, we will accept rate control as long as there's anticoagulation. But I want to impress on you that in heart failure, um, ablation is now uh, taking center stage in patients with concomitant atrial fibrillation. In fact, we are learning that the early we, re we refer the patients for ablation, the better the outcomes. We can actually cure the atrial fibrillation and preserve sinus rhythm for these patients. So definitely, um, uh, uh, there's a strong recommendation that if you have a patient who has heart failure and uh, degenerates to atrial fibrillation, don't wait. Pursue a rhythm uh, control strategy aggressively because that is showing to have better symptom response for the patient as well as better long-term outcomes. So ablation is definitely indicated. The issues with ablation, how risky it is, it is an invasive procedure. Uh, it's uh, ablation of the, usually we call it pulmonary vein isolation or a maze procedure to ablate the, the left atrium as well as the, 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 the pathways that can lead to conduction to um, uh, tech-induced cardiomyopathy. So it can have complications. These are small, usually in the region of 1% to 2% procedurally related complications. Uh, some patients can have recurrence, so after ablation, so you may need two or maybe sometimes three uh, procedures in order to have a 90% success rate. But what we are finding is that the earlier we refer patients, the success rate increases quite uh, exceptionally, which is quite encouraging. So my recommendation and my impression to you is if your patient has heart failure, 
has been in sinus rhythm, now has complicated with new onset atrial fibrillation, aggressively pursue a ryth sinus rhythm strategy, which includes escalation to ablation should the need be if the patient does not respond to DC cardioversion with bleta blockade. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Yeah, we don't have many more questions, but let me just want for me, heart failure treatment, when, when do you start as a GP? Do you start treatment or you refer? You must treat as a GP. So this condition, I, I, I think this is one of the elements that we've been fighting with funders. Um, I, I am also a member of the Heart Failure Society of South Africa. We've had many engagements with Med Scheme and Discovery about this to say um, they must uh, allow health practitioners to prescribe these agents because they are not enough cardiologists. This is not a physician's or specialist drug. These are safe drugs. In fact, SGLT2s will not cause complications used well. They will not precipitate hypoglycemia. So my recommendation is that as a general practitioner, you need to be confident with each of these molecules. You need to be brave to start them. You need to be brave to monitor them and to address any adverse events that the patients may have, such as the bradycardia, the symptomatic bradycardia, the hypotension, the renal dysfunction. You need to follow up your patients closely, especially as you're starting early, go slow and up titrate to target. You are saving lives. Not all these patients are going to see a cardiologist. In fact, where I practice in the state sector, I often uh, wonder patients in regional remote hospitals or, or healthcare settings that they need this knowledge. And as HEFSA, we want to disseminate it to those regions as well and not just focus on the private sector so that everyone, every medical officer is confident that they can treat this condition. We are all confident in treating TP. We need to be confident to treat heart failure with the therapies that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we, we need a full day seminar one day. Just one. <laughs> No, thank you very much. I'm going to ask Mary Edmund John will be here just to say a few words before I hand over to Dr. John Bohopa, who's our group occupational health manager. Just to... All right. Well, I want to say thank you very much, Prof. To be said, we really appreciate your willingness to share your clinical expertise, connecting with the other clinicians, sharing your passion for the heart failure patient with the goal of maximizing survival and minimizing the risk for these patients. And as you showed, heart failure is the cancer of cardiology. Dr. Bella, thank you for the guidance and the willingness to allow Prof. Tabese to share his clinical experience and, exp and expertise. The attendees will have benefited immensely. So thank you to both of you. Excellent, thank you, Marianne. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks uh, Marianne, for the assistance. Uh, Dr. Mopopa? Good evening, Dr. Bila. Good evening, colleagues. Prof. Sabetze, thank you very much for a very informative you know, presentation. Uh, to the colleagues that have tuned in today, join us again next week for yet another informative um, presentation on behalf of Clinics Health Group, uh, the management and the marketing team. We thank you and good night, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Good night.